There is a system of thought among young earth creationists and others who take Genesis as a literal account that seeks to explain the obvious similarities between various types of animals. It is also employed by creationists to attempt to explain how Noah and his family could have fit representatives of the entire non-aquatic animal kingdom onto a single boat. That system of thought is called baromenology. The basic idea of baromenology is that on day five and six of the creation week, God created stock kinds of, or archetypes for every group of animals that then after the global flood further diversified into various species. So for example, creationists would likely tell you that instead of taking two foxes, two coyotes, two jackals, and two wolves onto the ark, Noah's family just took two of the archetypal dog kind onto the ark, and that after the voyage there was somehow enough genetic diversity in their inbreeding offspring to create the wide variety of species and breeds we see in both the canid genus and the genus vulpus. They're essentially saying that two generic elephant kinds, who were probably babies to conserve space on the ark, could get off the boat and turn into the wide variety of the members of the family elephanted, including mammoths, mastodons, and the two existing species of elephants that we have today, who themselves are of two different genuses. Young Earth creationists are very careful to draw sharp distinctions between so-called macro and micro evolution. Macro evolution or transition from one kind to another is flatly denied by creationists, but micro evolution is begrudgingly accepted as it is necessary to make stories like Noah's Ark even remotely practical. It should be noted that this distinction is something you'll pretty much only hear in creationist circles. Most biologists do not use the terms micro and macro evolution. But more to my point, one of the biggest problems with baromenology is that very few creationists have been willing to even attempt to create a hard and fast definition for what these kinds are. I mean, secular scientists have fairly specific definitions when they talk about taxonomy, but what the hell is a baromen? We know it's not a species, but what is it? Is it a genus? Is it a family? Is it a suborder? What is it? Creationists don't seem to talk about this much. They just say that they don't believe in macroevolution and only believe in changes across kinds. Even what they mean by macroevolution seems vague. I guess the only thing that kind of corresponds to most of the points that they make about macroevolution is the concept of speciation, which has of course been observed in the animal kingdom among bugs, for example. But going into even bigger animals, creationism runs into problems when it tries to say that these kinds of transitions don't happen. Happen. One particular kind of animal that sticks out in my mind is something that is called a hybrid, particularly of the camelid sort. Now, camels and llamas are two animals that have obvious differences, so much so that they can't reproduce through normal mating processes. Yet through artificial insemination in a lab, their DNA can come together to form a really interesting creature called a camel. And the camel will be viable for many years. It'll live, live on for years. This is a problem because creationism teaches that kinds are fixed. As God said, let every creature reproduce after its own kind. That seems to me to imply that this kind of speciation should never reach such a point where two creatures of the same camelid kind or bearmen can't just hump each other naturally and have babies. It just doesn't make any sense. There's also the issue of extant creatures who, as far as taxonomy goes, are clearly linked but whose very existence undermines the so-called creation orchard. My favorite example of this is the order Testudines, which include tortoises and turtles. The reason why I'm using them as an example is that you have distinctly land-based members of this order who walk on legs and sometimes live in parched inland deserts, and also members who are majestic creatures of the sea who are adapted to life in the water. This is a problem for creationists because one of their key arguments is that new quote-unquote features never appear in any of the baromens, and yet in order to explain these differences in testudines, creationists have to accept one of two things. Either the descendants of the two archetypal testudines on the ark got off the boat, crawled into the sea, and eventually grew flippers, or aquatic turtles survived the flood outside of the ark, then eventually decided to come onto land, grow legs, adopt, adapt to dry environments, and become the desert tortoises who live in places like the southwest United States today. 
There's no other way around this unless creationists are willing to argue that land tortoises and sea turtles aren't really related to one another, sharing a common ancestor, and God just designed them to look similar. And I don't think that even young earth creationists would be willing to accept something that silly. We could go to other orders of animals and find similar examples, too. Look at the family Folivore. On one hand, we have arboreal tree slots, who are these tiny, cute little things. And on the other hand, we have the now extinct giant ground sloths, like Megatherium, who are in the same size range as an African elephant. They are both of the same family, according to most scientists, but are they of the same Barrowman creationist? Same thing with the felines. African lions, cheetahs, and the tabby in your house are all cats, but they can't breed with one another. Are they of the same kind? What about the extinct saber-toothed cats like Smilodon, or the scimitar cats like Homotheriums? Deeper still and more relevant to us, what about the fact that we know that there were other species of, gen of the genus Homo in the past? Where do the Neanderthals fit in here? We know that though they were very clearly humans, they were different enough from us that we can't really call them Homo sapiens. In, the sen in a sense, Neanderthals, unlike the ethnicities within humanity today, might actually biologically qualify as a different race of humans. Does that mean that humanity has its own creation orchard creationist? What does that do to the idea and doctrine of special creation? The greatest irony of creationist baromenology in my mind, though, is the fact that it actually requires an accelerated version of the evolutionary processes that young earth creationists decry in order to make it even remotely coherent. For example, this image from the Creation Museum shows how life allegedly quickly recovered after the flood. For example, the horse baromen grew in size from tiny Heracotherium, which had three toes, to the modern genus Equus, which includes modern horses, zebras, and donkeys. I guess the evidence for transitional fossils in this line of animals is too strong for even answers in Genesis to deny, but it's insane. Non-creation scientists claim that this transition happened over the course of 50 million years. Creationists are claiming it happened over the course of centuries, at most maybe a millennium. Creationists have to believe in evolution and natural selection on steroids to make it work. After thinking about it for a while, there's only one conclusion I can come to about baromenology. It has all kinds of problems.